everybody. It's Kevin Markarian, and I'm here with my good buddy, Sean Kakaska, awesome real estate coach. We're going to be talking about some really great information today, sharing some really great knowledge. Um, I'm filling in for Tristan today, and you probably see the name icon there, Tristan A. I'm not Tristan, uh, and but I'm going to be filling in for him today. I'm going to be talking with Sean. We're going to be going over lead conversion and mastery. And, uh, you know, I'm really, really excited to hear from you, Sean, because I've heard, you know, a lot of great things about um, what it is that you do on your, on the back end of your, you know, coaching system and your platforms and, and, uh, and all the knowledge that you've been, been so kind enough to share with us here at Lab Code Agents. So just really excited to have you on, man. And so just t take it away. Kevin, well, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm excited about our topic today because really there's three metrics, gang, that really prove extraordinary success in the real estate business. Now, I've coached with the best, there's no question about that, and here's what I've learned. It's really quite simple. It's first, knowing what to say, second, knowing how to say it, and third, saying it to enough people. Now, we're gonna talk about the first, of the th the first two of the three today. Uh, then it's up to you to get into action, to be accountable to the number of people that you contact on a daily basis. So I want to start with a question, and that is, what is the standard that you have for yourself as well as the salespeople on your team as it relates to the number of conversations that you're having on a daily basis? See, a lot of people, they, they approach this business without intentionality. They show up at the office and say, well, what am I going to do today, right? And it's, uh, they begin managing other people's priorities instead of their own. And I'll tell you, those that achieve extraordinary success, they take care of their own priorities first. Now, in real estate, those priorities, gang, they're pretty darn simple. It's just five things. It's lead generation, lead follow-up, going on appointments, negotiating your contracts, and practicing your skill set. Now, we recognize practice isn't something we did, it's something that we do on a consistent and repetitive basis to sharpen our skills. Because really how you show up in the world, well, it's based on your state of being. And there's four things that make up your state of being. That's first, your knowledge, knowing what to say, right? Second is your skills, uh, knowing how to say it. And then third would be your mindset. And when you practice the first two on a consistent repetitive basis, well, it has a positive impact on your mindset. And the fourth is your habits. Now, I believe that the habits is the most important aspect of extraordinary success in real estate sales because we're independent contractors. I mean, we want all the freedom. We want all the flexibility, right? Yet we struggle with ways to be accountable to our goals. Uh, you know, that's why mentorship works. That's why having an accountability buddy works. That's why having a great coach works. So when you focus on improving your state of being, well, then you'll do what that, that person you desire to be does. And ultimately you'll have what you desire to have in this industry. So what I wanna do is I wanna start off with this uh, simple word as I have on multiple webinars I've done with my friends over at Lab Coat Agent. By the way, you guys are doing a bang up job, Kevin. I love everything you guys are pumping out. Keep up the great work, man. Thank you, thank you. Excited, excited, up, excited about all the new things that are happening and really, really excited to talk with you today, man. So beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. So we're going to start with this simple word, success. And yet if you had the time and took the time and you asked a thousand different people, what is their definition of that word? we would probably get about a thousand different answers. So frankly, I just went to Webster's Dictionary. I looked up the word gang and, and here's what I found. It's really quite simple. Webster says success is getting what you want. Not what someone else wants. It's what you want. Yet in order to be successful, we've obviously got to know something, right? And that's what we want. Yet most people take an average approach on identifying what they want, and then even worse, an average approach on how they're gonna go ahead and get it. That's not this webinar game. We're talking through the proven best practices in real estate sales as it relates to lead conversion. See, the smart person, Kevin, and I know you'll agree, the smart person learns from their own mistakes, right? Absolutely. And the other person, I'm sorry? I said, I've made a ton of them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people who achieve extraordinary success in this business, they're able to do that because they've increased their failure quotient, meaning they fail more often than anybody else. And as a direct result, they succeed more often than anybody else. So the smarter person though, I mean, the smart person learns from their own mistakes, right? The smarter person learns from the mistakes of others and the smartest people of all 
They learn from the successes of other individuals. See, I believe that success leaves clues. One of my mentors shared that with me so many years ago, meaning people have gone before us. Now, Kevin, I've sold over 4,000 homes in my real estate career, over a billion dollars in sales volume. So I've been there. I've done all of that. And the more I know, it seems the less I know. So unless I keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the market, what's working, what's trending, what's not working with all the disruption and the technology that is coming into our business and our industry, guys, we've got to stay vigilant and study our skill set, our knowledge, because the bottom line is, is we could become Netflix if we're not careful, right? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of disruption taking place. So what I do here at Icon Coaching, and I want you to recognize that you all get the opportunity to benefit from this. All you have to do is make the decision to simply engage in what we do because most of what we do, gang, it's absolutely free. For example, the Icon of the Month interviews. What I do is I identify what I consider to be an icon in real estate sales, somebody who's just crushing it. And I'll fly out to their office, I'll study their models, their systems. I have the pleasure of interviewing their staff, reviewing their scripts, their dialogues, the technology that they're leveraging um, to really assemble the, what I call the proven best practices in this industry. So here's a couple of the past icons uh, of the month. For example, Chris Waters here in my hometown of Austin, Texas, last October. I mean, the guy is closing over 100 transactions per year. Mark Spain in the lower left, 3,100 transactions per year. Guys, success leaves clues. Now, remember the definition of success, though. The definition is getting what you want, not what someone else thinks you want, right? Now, I'm sharing with this information with you, not because some of you want to go out and close 3,100 transactions per year. Some of you, that's, that's the furthest thing from your goals. It's the first, furthest thing from your mindset, and that's okay because success, again, it's getting what you want. What I want to do is uh, I want to just share with you that, that we've studied the proven best practices. So, I mean, if you want to close 10 transactions a year, fantastic. You want to close five, that's perfect. You want to close 500, you want to close 1,000, well, tune in. Whatever your goal is, you're going to pick up some nuggets today that you can apply to your business and then become a success, all right? So, uh, in order to engage in our free Icon of the Month webinar series, and we do this every single month, you just simply go to our website at iconcoaching.com re.com. And I'll go ahead and type that into the chat box here as well, Kevin. And, and, I'll, and I'll also put it in the comments, guys. So if you miss it, it'll be in the comments. Um, so yeah, I'll post it on there so you guys will see. Excellent. Excellent. Good, good. So um, what I want to do, I wanted to really talk about this question right here. And let me just type this in real quick. There we go. Okay. So why are some agents converting a high percentage of leads while other agents suffer? Now, before I dive into this, I'll tell you that most realtors that I come across, they don't have a lead generation problem. What they have is a lead conversion problem. They just, they don't quite know how to get there. Now I've identified some reasons that they're not converting at a high level. And the first one I wanna share with you is uh, response time. Meaning they're not getting back to the prospect just fast enough, right? Uh, it used to be that we had a sunset rule in real estate back in the nineties, meaning we could return a call before the sun went down and everybody was happy, right? I mean, we met the expectations of our prospects, yet the California Association of Realtors, they've done a recent study that suggests that 49% of the buyer prospects and seller prospects out there in real estate sales expect an instant response, not five minutes, not three minutes, an instant response, yet in their studies, it suggests that only 8% of realtors are actually delivering that level of service. So think about that. Only 8%. By the way, Kevin, I don't think that 8% was on purpose. I Meaning I don't think they have the tools, the models, the systems, the technology, or the people to really deliver that on a consistent and repetitive basis. So I think it was merely by happenstance, right? They just happened to be in front of their computer when the web lead came in, or they just happened to answer their phone that, that time that it rang, right? So the right. key to this though, it's all about speed to lead guys. So when we think about leverage, there's really four categories of leverage. The first is leverage through models. So what I'm speaking to here is your lead generation model, your lead follow-up and conversion models, your economic model, your budget model, your compensation models when you know scaling through people. All of those models must work in concert with the systems that you've developed. 
Now, Kevin, a system to me, well, it's nothing more. It's nothing less than a standardized process that produces a consistent and predictable result. Meaning you and your people, your team, your vendors, your buyer's agents, your listing specialists, your OSAs, your ISAs, you do it the same way every single time, modified only for the natural behavioral tendencies of your prospect, and you get that consistent and predictable result. And that's so powerful. Real quick, Sean, if you don't mind me uh, interjecting something here. It's so important, especially in our business, obviously being 100% commission sales people, the importance of having a consistent flow of business. I mean, that's one of the, cha- the biggest challenges, I think, in the industry. And, I, and you may agree with me is that people f- are having the, the trouble that they have to generate business, right? So if you have these systems that you're talking about, that eliminates or reduces the likelihood of failure because you've got a, you've got a predictable income at that point. Well, you're exactly right, Kevin. And see, a lot of people, they'll, they'll jump from this phase of their growth called pipeline. Now, pipeline to me, it's all about churning it out. It's about getting on the phone. It's about the number of people you talk to on a daily basis, about your lead generation, your lead follow-up. Now, those with tenacity break through into the next area that I call momentum. Now, this momentum, it's a great place to be. By the way, momentum, funny thing about it, it's the greatest magnifier in business, in my opinion. Meaning, when you have momentum, well, you appear to be 10 times better than you actually are. (laughs) And when you lack momentum, well, you appear to be 10 times worse than you actually are. And funny thing about momentum, I mean, if you had a locomotive that was traveling at, say, 55 miles an hour, it will crush through a five-foot wall of concrete that's reinforced by steel, and man, that thing will keep on going. Yet, if you took that same locomotive in a stationary position, you could take a one-inch block and put it under the wheels and it'll never get going at all. So tools to give you the knowledge, to give you the skills, to really remove the blocks from your momentum. So uh, as we talk about this area of momentum, though, it's a fun place to be. And it's also a very scary place to be. See, Because most people that have tenacity, that pipeline phase, they break through to momentum. And they're getting buyer agency contracts signed, getting listing contracts signed. They're getting offers in on their listings, writing offers for their buyers. and, And everything seems to be firing on all cylinders. And it's a great place to be. It's a lot of fun. Yet what most realtors do is they get sucked down in the weeds, don't they, Kevin? And they then hand-holding the prospect or the client at this point to the closing table and dealing with the inspection issues. And, and they just, they stop that pipeline phase. See, they get to momentum and they think, man, I've arrived. I'm here. I've finally done it, right? And then they look up about 30 days later and sure, they just had a lot of great closings. Yet now all of a sudden, they're back down in the pipeline phase of their business and they've fallen backward in that model toward mastery. See, yeah. rather, when we get to momentum, gang, we've got to look at leverage and we've got to get you to leverage as quickly as possible. And, you know, going back, and I know I'm going down this bunny trail here, yet stick no, with it's good. They're really good. I'm following you. <laughs> I, I have some questions for you too. Perfect. So four areas of leverage. We talked about models, right? We talked about systems, then the next area of leverage is through technology. Now, technology can be your best friend in this industry. It can also be your worst enemy. See, so many shiny objects popping up left and right for realtors that are all trying to get into your pockets. I'll tell you what, at Icon, we have the pleasure of vetting the latest and greatest technology, the things that are bombarding you as realtors where everybody's clamoring for your wallet. Uh, We vet these processes we work with uh, individuals like one that comes to mind right off the top of my head is Grant Weiss over at Real Estate Marketing University. Now he teaches realtors how to do Facebook ads. And, uh, you know, I was really skeptical when I met Grant. He wanted me to do a webinar with him and expose him to our clients. And I said, listen, Grant, here's what I'm willing to do. I, I said, I will, I will have two of my clients that are in no inventory markets engage in your system for free, meaning you're going to give away your platform for free. And you're going to take them through this process and we're going to track their results. And if their results are adequate and they're getting a a massive return on their time invested, well, then we can maybe talk about what it looks like to have Icon help you kind of grow what you're doing over there. And man, I got to tell you, after 60 days, I personally was blown away with what they've come up with, what they were able to accomplish. So Grant, my hat's off to you, buddy. I know my clients that have engaged with you have really gained a lot from you. So so we'll go through and we'll vet various technologies from CRMs to 
uh, autoresponders to even service providers like Grant Weiss and his team to make sure that whatever investment you're making, gang, that you're going to get a return on investment. I promise you, I'll never recommend something that's not going to make you a ton of money considering what you're spending. So uh, leveraging through technology is absolutely critical. I think you'll all agree. And then the fourth category of leverage is through people. So identifying the right talent to really grow your business and then leaning into that talent, meaning don't take the job back from them. See, once you engage somebody, whether you're a single agent, you hire on your first buyer specialist or your first showing partner or your first listing specialist or OSA, guys, um, I think the challenge for most realtors is they ultimately take that job back from them. See, the best part about that person that you've just hired, whether an independent contractor on commission only or you're paying them a salary plus bonus and commissions or whatever that model looks like, um, the best part about their job is that it's their job. And you've got to just lean into those people. You can't be that knight in shining armor on your white horse to ride in and save them. See, that's the reason you've hired them. And then you reallocate whatever time they've given back to you by working with you into your 20% activities, those dollar productive activities, they're gonna produce significant results for you and the entire organization. So Kevin, I'll go back to you real quick, buddy. Um, what questions did you have? So a um, couple questions real quick. So just to confirm the four areas of, le of leverage are models, systems, technology, and people. Is that right? You got it. Okay, and then as far as go to go going back to what you're talking about with momentum, um, when you talk about momentum, would you agree? I mean, one of the challenges a lot of people have is like call reluctance or, you know, just getting started. So what, one of the things that I talk about a lot is, is really just, just getting into it. Once you start rolling and getting into the process, the momentum starts to build. Would you agree? Uh, undoubtedly. Yes. See, there's, uh, there's two forces that pull and push on us every day. And it's either our need to avoid pain or our desire to gain something, whatever that is. And most of us though are, you know, based on human needs like psychology, we're geared and wired toward the avoidance of pain. And most people with call reluctance, what I find is that where their attention goes, their energy flows, right? Meaning if I focus my energy and attention on the pain associated with proactive lead generation and lead follow-up, meaning I'm actually gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna call a complete stranger and put myself at risk, I generally am going to focus on the negative and we've been conditioned our entire lives to go to the negative, right? I think back to when you were a kid and you, you took a test in school. I mean, did the teacher put like big gold stars on every answer you got right? Or did they put the big fat red check mark on the one or two you got wrong? The big of fat course. red check mark. <laughs> right. I had a lot of those, by the, way. Go, by the way. Let's say there was a hundred questions on this quiz and you got 98 of them right and two wrong. Where did your mind go? To the 98 you got right? Or the two you got wrong. The two I got wrong. No doubt. And like when we're driving down the highway, when you look at the dash of your cars, they're like a green smiley face that says, hey, Sean, everything's great. Keep driving. <laughs> we're only notified when something goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So we're conditioned to go to the negative. So when I think about calling somebody, I'm going to focus my, my energy on the perception of possible pain associated with that conversation. I'm going to focus on the, the fear of rejection. And if I focus my energy there, recognizing that, you know, frankly, what we focus on expands, right? Um, I'm never going to pick up the phone. So I'm going to end up with this, what we call call reluctance and the pain of being forced out of this business. The pain of, of going out and getting a quote unquote real job is not nearly as great as the pain of picking up the phone to call somebody. Mm, great rather, when we do a switch cost in our mind, and I have to give Anthony Robbins credit for this work because it is powerful and and when we recognize that the greater of two pains always wins, see rather to do a switch cost, what we do is we focus our energy and attention on the pain of not doing it. The pain of not lead generating. And just make that pain as, as deep as you possibly can. Meaning if I don't lead generate, well, I'm not gonna have any money. That in and of itself is painful to me. Yet right. if I don't have any money, I can't make my car payment and that could be repossessed. That, that's painful. I mean, what, if, uh, what if I have a mortgage on my house and I can't make the mortgage payment several months in a row, uh, might get foreclosed upon. See, to me, that's, that's really painful. And you know, think it deep though. I mean, how would your friends view you? How would your family view you if you couldn't make it in real estate sales? Wow. 
you, to me, guys, that is really painful. And then plus we focus on what we gain from uh, our lead generation activities. I mean, think about it. You, it's a lot more than just cashing a commission check, right, Kevin? Right. I mean, it's, uh, you get to make friends, create relationships that you didn't have before. You get to add help value them. to others and help them accomplish their goals in real estate to realize the, the ultimate American dream, right? It's home ownership. And when you get to do that, I tell you, you get a lot of fulfillment from focusing on the gain. And when you focus your energy and attention on the pain of not doing it, I promise you guys, that pain, that perception of pain of actually picking up the phone and lead generating, guys, that just melts away. And Man, that's it, a very really great way of looking at it. That's, yeah, uh, so it's either we use pain and gain to our advantage or pain and gain, frankly, it uses us. Mm. Yeah. So let's get back to uh, this uh, California Association of Realtors case study real quick. So, you know, within 30 minutes, if you can get back to that prospect, let's say 29% of the people are satisfied, yet only 7% of realtors are delivering net, less than an hour, only 16% satisfied, yet 11% of realtors, less than two hours, 4% are satisfied. Think about it. You're about to get a sandwich with a buddy and you come back, you got a voicemail message, you're two hours late, only four out of 100 are happy. Wow. <laughs> so less than four hours, 2% are satisfied. More than 24 hours, 0% again. So guys, here's what's interesting about this case study. See, we're in 2018 right now. This case study was actually done in 2014. So Kevin, let me ask you, buddy. Do you yes. think consumers' expectation of our industry has increased or decreased since then? <laughs> I would say it's increased. <laughs> Substantially, and it's not our fault, right? It's because of companies like Amazon, where I could take my phone and two clicks and something shows up at my door at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Why on earth can't my realtor answer their phone? Right. Or uh, if I can put a, a package in a metal box and at 9 a.m. tomorrow, it's going to be clear across the country in the hands of the person I wanted to send it to. Why can't my brochure box be full all the time? Right? Right. Other industries are really causing us to raise the bar. So let's get into the next reason that I believe that realtors are not able to convert leads at a high percentage. And I think it's number of attempts. In fact, top producer did a case study for us that suggests that if you attempt to reach a prospect six times within six days, your ability to convert that prospect to increase by 900%. Wow. 900%. Yet in the same case study, they cited that the average realtor attempted to contact a lead 1.2 times before they threw it away. So to me, my input would be create a standard for yourself. At least seven contacts in a seven day period seven touches in seven days. See, the digital marketing revolution and big box retailers like Zillow and Realtor.com and Trulia, they've given the prospect the opportunity to self-identify way too early in the pipeline. Meaning they could be two years out, three years out, yet they couldn't sleep one night and they opened up their, their tablet and they said, uh, they click on Realtor.com and filled out some web form and now all of a sudden the realtor thinks, oh, I got this lead. They're not a lead at all. They're in what I call the dreaming phase of buying or selling real estate. So two distinct phases now, the dreaming phase and the actual buying and listing phase. And here's the biggest challenge that we all are faced with. If we ignore them during the dreaming phase gang, they'll ignore us when they get to the buying or listing phase. So what do I think when I hear that? I think you need to leverage technology and the right CRM in order to nurture the prospects along to remain front of mind. When they think real estate, we want them to think you. And at Icon, I believe we've got that secret sauce. I think we've, we've kind of cracked that code to where you can consistently touch on them. And with the right messaging at the right time, then you'll position yourself appropriately to earn their business when they get in that buying and listing phase. So let's go to the next phase. And I got a lot of content to cover. So I'm going to blast through this one real quick. They're just not efficient with their time. I, they show up and, and rather than managing their own priorities, they begin managing others. And let's face it, the moment you open your email inbox, you've made a conscious and unconscious decision to begin managing other people's priorities instead of your own. And those that achieve extraordinary success in this business game, they take care of their own priorities first and then begin managing others. So as it relates to time, I would encourage you to look at it in two distinct buckets. Your first bucket, which is eight to 12, would be your dollar productive time. This is your priority. Then 12 to whatever time you want to quit working that day, that's time for everything else, right? So two distinct buckets, your 
20% time, the dollar productive time, and your 80% time, the non-dollar productive time. And I'll tell you, those that I work with that adhere to a perfect week schedule who are intentional with their investment of time, where they time block their activities, they show up at the office, they know exactly what they're going to be doing from eight o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock, nine to 10, 10 to 11, so on and so forth. They've, they've spelled it all out and they stick to that time block schedule. I tell you, the natural byproduct is results. Yet, most people got into this business, Kevin, for three reasons. First, freedom, right? Second, flexibility. And the third is financial wealth because everybody in real estate is rich, right? <laughs> so, so the challenge is though that they chose freedom and flexibility first and they never got around fi financial wealth. See, and if they'd only chosen discipline first, mm -hmm. now we don't have to be disciplined in all things, just a handful of things. And my input to you is be disciplined from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then become a distraction to everybody else. I mean, the bottom line is you've taken care of the priority of the day. Now you can go do whatever it is that you want, right? So take care of your own priorities first. I'm going to share a simple strategy with you that will, without question, help you improve your productivity when you're at work. I call it the 4D approach. Many of you have heard of this before, yet uh, the first of the 4Ds is ask yourself the question, can I ditch it? Does it even need to be done at all? Yet in this, real estate, in this real estate industry, we're trained to do something a certain way and unfortunately fall into that rut. And rarely do we question how we do things. And I'll share a simple example with you. Kevin, when I started my real estate career, I was 20 years old and I was a buyer's agent, probably one of the first ones on the face of this planet. That model didn't exist back in those days. And yet I was trained to go on all of my home inspections myself. Yet I'd systemized the process. I flew down, uh, met up with Michael Gerber, the author of The E-Myth, and I got my E-Myth certification and I came back with a thirst uh, of just systemizing our entire process. And I started with the buy side of the business and I, I systemized that from start to finish, meaning we do it exactly this way every single time and we would tweak it from time to time to split test and, and truly identify the most effective way to approach the buy side of the business. And I found myself closing well over 100 buyer side transactions per year, year after year after year. Now, of course, you can't do that volume when working with buyers unless you're systemized. Would you agree, Kevin? Absolutely. And I hope you, I would imagine you teach those systems to people that are part of your it's uh, that is my why buddy that is my purpose on the face of this planet is yeah. to convey this knowledge with others no doubt yeah, that's so important i mean especially if you're working with buyers or sellers i mean just being distracted and being pulled in a million different directions it's, it's really really hard to uh to stay focused and disciplined so i really i mean this is great stuff i ultimately went on to become a listing specialist then take over the entire team and ultimately through an exit strategy sell the team off and uh go to work at at KW Corporate for seven years. And then I founded Icon Coaching almost two years ago. So nevertheless, um, I share that experience as a buyer's agent with you because uh, back in those days, I was going on every one of my home inspections personally. Now, do some simple math with me, guys. I mean, if you, if you had a, it, just 100, and there was well over 100 that I'd go on per year, yet the average home inspection takes three hours. So if you do the math, 100 times three, that's 300 hours. Now divide that by a 40-hour work week. Isn't that seven and a half weeks of a 52 week year, 40 hours a week that I was investing in home inspections? How did you do it? <laughs> well, it was, um, uh, it was challenging. I found it <laughs> frustrating, right? Uh, only because if the furnace is broken, man, the furnace is broken. I can't fix it. So nevertheless, I, I went to my broker finally and I said, hey, listen, do I need to go on all these home inspections myself? Can I send an assistant? I mean, I've got a trusted home inspector. He's licensed, he's bonded, he's insured, right? Um, and nevertheless, he said, no, you can't. You have to go on these yourself. So I finally reached out to our attorney and said, hey, can I send an assistant? I mean, is there something in the code of ethics that says I personally have to be there? Well, nevertheless, the attorney approved it, took some education, took some training, and I was able to not ever go on another home inspection ever again. And I was able to send an assistant in my place, somebody who I trusted very, very much. Um, so nevertheless, though, I got seven and a half weeks of my life back merely by asking myself the question, can I ditch it? Does it even need to be done at all, right? Mm -hmm. Then the second D in this 4D approach, Yang, is ask yourself, can I delegate it? Who can do this for me? Now, again, going back to being a buyer's agent, so many hours of my day were invested in following up with buyers that weren't going anywhere. And I know you can all relate. 
And you make those calls, and I made those calls because I couldn't stand the gut-wrenching, sick feeling I would get in my stomach when I'd follow up with a buyer prospect a week too late just to find out that they just went under contract. Mm -hmm. just, that it, happens so many, so stomach. often, so often. So delegate is, the delegate, um, delegation is so hard for agents. I think that's one of the biggest challenges for two reasons. Number one is the control aspect, right? So because, because we're, you know, we're the, we're the accountant, we're the marketing person, we're the, we're the lead generator, we're the business management person, it's hard for us to let go. That was the biggest challenge for me before I started my team. And then the other part of this, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is the cost aspect. So to me, there's two challenges with delegation is the control and then the cost. So how do you deal with that? Well, I think first off in business, what we must recognize, and some of us get it sooner than, than others, is that we don't need to be control freaks. What we need are controls. Mm. So what I mean by that is, uh, and I, by the way, I, I hired Susan Scott years ago to present at one of our conferences. Now she's the author of Fierce Conversations. She came and stayed at our home and, and just a wonderful, wonderful woman, highly intelligent. She described to me during our initial meeting what she calls the decision tree. So she said, um, imagine a, a tree in the middle of a wide open field. Now it's a very large tree, call it 200 feet tall. I mean, large tree. And it's middle summer, it's in full bloom and it's gorgeous, right? Now imagine that tree loses a leaf. It's not gonna die. Imagine that tree loses a twig. It's definitely not gonna die, right? Or even a branch, it's not going to kill the tree. However, if it loses the trunk or the root structure, well, that tree's a goner, right? So she asked me, she said, in your organization, Sean, what are the leaf decisions? And you've, have you articulated that? What are the twig decisions? What are the branch decisions? What are the trunk and root structure decisions that you need to be invested in? And it's like a light bulb went off. I mean, I remember immediately going back to our transaction coordinator and saying, listen, while you're negotiating inspection items, if you can solve the problem for $500 or less, write the check and don't even tell me about it. I don't care. Because I recognize the time value of money, right? Meaning, if I have to take that buyer, put him back in my car, or our buyer's agent puts him in their car, or if I have to put that listing back on the market to renegotiate yet another offer, for 500 bucks, just solve the problem and don't even involve me. To me, it's a leaf decision, it doesn't matter. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have to go back and put that buyer in your car or put that listing back on the market, you are so much more money ahead just to write the check, right? And do it in a way that, uh, that you'll get referrals from it as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So we don't need to be control freaks in business game. We just need controls, okay? And then the delegation aspect, I think uh, it becomes easier and easier to delegate the higher and higher your volume goes. Meaning the higher your volume goes, the less attached to the outcome you become. Meaning if you had... 15 pending transactions right now on the board. If one of them is having a little bit of an issue, how concerned are you? A lot less concerned if I only had one in, in contact. <laughs> exactly. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like the branch idea, right? That you just described. Right, right. Yet if I've got one pending transaction that is limping along and it looks like it might not close, well, of course, I'm going to invest every ounce of energy and time that I've got into it to make sure that that thing closes. Gosh, and this is so good. And it goes back to what you're talking about with momentum because if you don't have the momentum to get you to that first, second, third, fourth, 15 transaction and the, and the, and the systems and the leverage and the people and the models, you're going to be struggling and you're going to be concerned about that one deal or hopefully even have a deal. Right. That's exactly right. Kevin, you're right. So uh, going back to my time as a buyer's agent, um, so much time was invested in following up with the leads that weren't going anywhere. So I asked myself the question, well, yeah, it needs to be done, right? Yet, yeah, can I delegate it? Well, I didn't have an assistant at the time. Um, so I thought, well, who else benefits when I personally close a real estate transaction? My mind immediately went to my lender. So I called him up, had a meeting with him, and I said, hey, listen, uh, I want to give you the shot at earning the business of every one of our buyer prospects. And we've got a lead generation machine going here. Yet, you've got to earn that right. And he said, well, Sean, what do I have to do? I said, you need to follow up with my C buyer prospects until they buy or die. He said, no problem. I, I consider that to be my job. I said, perfect. And I need you to use the scripts that I'm going to give you right now. 
I said, okay, well, let's review them. Well, the first one, it went like this. Uh, hey, Kevin, it's John over at XYZ Mortgage Company. John Kokoska asked me to give you a call. Now, Kevin, before I begin, I just, uh, I got to take a moment. I've got to commend you on your selection of a real estate agent. You know what? Sean is by far the best realtor I've ever come across. I've been doing this for 25 years. Tell me, how did you get in touch with Sean? See, they became a third party endorsement for me. See, if, if I, I mean, I didn't say it. If I said it, it would be ego based. And we all know people who have massive egos, right? Uh, some of us are sitting next to those people right now. <laughs> um, with that said, though, uh, I couldn't say it, yet they can say it because now they're a third-party endorsement, right? And right. let's transfer that beyond just your mortgage loan originator. Uh, let's say you go on a listing appointment. You recognize, well, their carpets need to be cleaned. And you say, hey, I've got a great carpet cleaning vendor partner that, that I'd love to come out and give you a quote. They're going to save you some money. They do an outstanding job. And then you call your carpet cleaner the moment you leave. Let's say you leave that, that listing appointment without the listing. Mm -hmm. You call up your carpet cleaner and you say, listen, uh, I might get this listing. I might not get this listing. However, uh, they need their carpets cleaned. And here's what I want you to say. This is John with XYZ Carpet Cleaning Company. And Sean Kokoska asked me to give you a call. And before I begin, I just want to commend you on your selection of a real estate agent. You know, I've never met anybody more professional or anybody that would work harder for you than Sean. How did you get in touch with Sean? Wow, that's really good. So now the, the carpet cleaner is now helping me convert my lead. You follow right. me? And you're, delega <laughs> and you're delegating. Yeah. So when, I was, when, I, when people think delegation, like for me, my initial thought was cost, money. I have to pay somebody, right? Which what you just described is absolutely free. Absolutely. And so for you single agents out there that are looking to expand your influence, expand your production, your profits through other people, through leverage, just recognize it doesn't have to cost you anything. You can apply that thought process, that methodology to your painter, to your carpet cleaner, to your roofer, to your window person, whatever it is, they can all come in and be that third party endorsement for you and help you convert your leads, right? So let's go to the third, do it later. Now, I, I wrote at the top here, a habit of productivity. Now habit is gonna require sustained discipline until you can actually own that habit, right? So on average, uh, Megan Oaten out of the University College of London in Australia, as well as uh, Charles Duhigg, the author of Power of Habit, suggests that it takes on average 66 days to form a habit. So it's going to take sustained discipline of you practicing this 4D approach before it becomes, you know, to the point of automaticity or habitual, if you will. So do it later. The only way you can actually answer that question firmly is to have a time block schedule to know that I've got a time block between 12 and 12.30 to check my email and return phone calls, then again between 3 and 3.30, and finally between 5.30 and 6. And then I just do what I say I'm going to do, right? Like, for example, in my outbound voicemail, it could say, hi, this is Sean Kokoska with XYZ Realty. Thank you so much for your call. I'll be returning calls today between 12 and 12.30, again between 3 and 3.30, and finally between 5.30 and 6. Now, given your schedule and availability, leave me your name and phone number, and the best time, given the three options for me to return your call, it'd be my pleasure to do so. By the way, if this is urgent, please text me at this number and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I mean, really simple, right? Yeah. Then when your cell phone rings, then you can, say, you can truly say, I can do that later because they're going to hear that voicemail. They're going to leave me a message or they're going to text me, at which time I might go to the fourth D, right? Same thing with email. Like if you're focused on lead generation, lead follow-up, and you get that friendly little window that pops up and reminds you, hey, Kevin, you got a new email. If you click on that and it opens your email inbox, you've now made a conscious and unconscious decision to begin managing other people's priorities instead of your own priorities, right? Yes. Rather you talked about the, and, oh, you, and you mentioned that in the beginning is taking care of yourself as part of success. So that just goes right into that. I have a question for you. So there's a lot of different ideas on this and I've loved your idea. And this is just a flat out just question for me to you and very curious to know. So, People talk about prospecting and follow-up and time blocking for that. What do you recommend is a good amount of time for prospecting each day or each week or whatever it is that you have in mind for that, for, for an individual agent? Yeah, well, there's so many different modalities that it, as it relates to prospecting, right? I mean, with the digital marketing revolution of Facebook and LinkedIn and Pinterest and all of that, I would recommend that you invest at least two hours in uh, lead generation every morning. 
So, you know, for me, with my perfect week schedule, my time blocks, when I was actively in production, it was eight to 10 for lead generation. Then it was 10 to 12 for lead follow-up. And let's agree that those are two totally different categories, right? Lead follow-up, these people have already raised their hand. They've reached out to you somehow, some way. Now, those are the warmer leads, obviously, that you're going to convert. Yet, if you're not consistently adding new leads to the to your database, well, then, uh, you know, you're either green and growing or ripe and rotten, right? You know what I mean? So you've yes. got to be constantly adding additional leads into the pipeline every single day. So eight to 10 lead generation. And that could be a, a handful of different modalities. Maybe you're the type who wants to call for sale by owners. Maybe maybe you prefer to call expired listings and old expireds. Maybe you'd rather invest your time in Facebook ads and you know commenting on other people's posts to create that awareness of who you are and what you do and and all that fun stuff, right? So uh, at least two hours though in that proactive sense of lead generation. And when you say lead generation, Sean, are you talking about being in front of a computer or being focused at, at, at a spe during a specific time, those two hours during the day and kind of being focused during those times and following up and reaching out to people? Is that what you're talking about every single day? Absolutely, it's, uh, it's the term of focused workflow versus interrupted workflow. So, um, you know, I'm going to steal some of Gary Keller's language from the one thing, which I had the pleasure of writing all of that, that curriculum around the workshop, the teleseminars, uh, the keynotes and all of that fun stuff. And uh, uh, just a, a great bit of work that he and Jay Papazan put together. And Gary referenced, you know, building a bunker, mm -hmm. a place where you can go that nobody else could get to you. You know, it's a military term, like the enemy is firing upon you, get to your bunker so that they can't attack you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a place where you can truly be focused, no interruptions, right? He also said, you know, sweep for mines, what interrupts you? Store provisions, what do you get up from your desk for? See, if I get up from my desk and I go out to get a pop, pot of coffee at the office, you know, I'm going to get sniped, right? Somebody's going to say, oh, Sean, hey, great to see you. And this two-minute trip to get a new cup of coffee, well, it turns into a 15-minute distraction, right? Mm -hmm. So rather have a Keurig in your, in your bunker, right? You can just pop a little pot in there and, and make your cup of coffee and then finally enlist support. So I think that's just great lessons that Gary and Jay shared with everybody. And, and I just echo that so many times uh, when working with our clients to really help them ring out the day to improve the value of their time currency. See, all of our time is worth something, right? And, you know, I think back when I was uh, just a teenager and uh, my parents took me to Mexico for the first time and I went up to that exchange booth and I couldn't believe, I mean, I was shocked the exchange rate back then was like 20 to one. My money was worth more than anybody else's there, right? So uh, how I want you to view this is a, a lot of people, they say, well, okay, here's what I'm going to do, Kevin. I'm going to take 20% of my gross annual income. I'm going to put that aside in a, a 401k or a savings account, right? And in 10 years time, Kevin, I'll be able to pay cash for that vacation home that me and my family have always wanted. Okay. Here's the challenge. Most people look at that vacation home and they look at the price tag of that vacation home and, and call it a million dollars. The number doesn't matter, right? They just look at the price tag. See, rather than looking at it as though that vacation home costs a million dollars, what if you changed the way you thought about this? What if you looked at it as though it doesn't cost a million dollars, it costs 10 years to mm. buy the house? Wow. Uh, this, the average human being these days lives to be 78 years old. You're giving up almost a, a, an eighth of your life, more than an eighth of your life to own that vacation home. And what if there was a certain methodology that you could apply to your business that enables you to do it, to buy that home, not for 10 years, you can buy it for three years or two and a half years. And so that's what I'm talking about as it relates to uh, being efficient with your time, right? Just to wring out the day every day to get as much as you can out of it. And you can only do that in a focused workflow manner. See, because the moment somebody interrupts you, what you have to do is you have to switch from that task. You have to orient to the distraction, then deal with the distraction then switch tasks back to the primary work, reorient to the primary work. And researchers estimate, by the way, in corporate America, there's 43 interruptions in an eight hour day. Hmm. Now we're in real estate. <laughs> there's a heck of a lot more than 43. I think you right. can agree. They also research, researchers estimate that we have 4,000 conscious thoughts every day. Throw in the subconscious thoughts, we're over 60,000 thoughts per day. So we're interrupting ourselves more than anybody else interrupts us, that's for sure. Yet because of those interruptions, because our mind interrupts itself every like 14 seconds, okay. research 
estimate that we lose 28% of our productivity because of this interrupted workflow. So by going to a space where nobody can get to you, by focusing your time and your energy, then ultimately you'll, you'll be able to take care of your own priority first, right? So yes. you know, being able to say do it later, you're able to then chunk activities together for the highest level of productivity given the time you're investing. So let's go to the fourth D, and that's the last resort, right? Do it now. Yet most realtors want to do everything right now. <laughs> As a result, they end up with 15 projects all working simultaneously. Their focus is so diluted that they've mistaked movement for achievement, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all experienced that phenomenon. I've shown up at the office early, you know, working all day long, working late, showing up back home late at night. And you look back upon the day and you say, well, yeah, sure, I was busy. Did I make any money? <laughs> and if the answer is no, guys, it's a pretty darn short road to burnout. Right? right? And I promise you, if you apply or when you apply this 4D approach to your day and, and you apply it to everything that you think about doing, and I don't care if it's a piece of paper on your desk or returning a phone call, if you just take a second and you go through the first D, can I ditch it? Can I delegate it? Can I do it later? Or should I do it right now? Then at least you're making a conscious decision about what you're doing day in and day out. So let's talk about the, the final reason. You know, they just don't know what to say. So I, I think to kind of posture this next portion of our talk today, I, I wanted to outline the, the two goals of every prospect. And it's going to seem counterintuitive, yet I think eventually you're going to agree with me that this is how every prospect approaches the, the situation, the conversation. First, especially like a buyer prospect, they're going to want to eliminate the property. And like I said, it seems counterintuitive, yet think back to the last time uh, and, and let's just create a hypothetical situation. Let's say that you're in the market to buy an old muscle car, like a 1968 Super Sport Camaro, right? Nice. And that's, that's one of my dream cars, right? Yet, uh, let's say you get the Auto Trader magazine and you flip over to the Chevy section, you go to the Camaro section, and immediately your mind goes into elimination mode. I mean, you look at the first ad and you say, oh, wrong color, cross it off the list, right? Oh, too many miles, cross it off the list. Hasn't been refurbished, cross it off the list. Oh, the paint job is terrible, right? So you're, right. you're looking to invest your time wisely and your prospects are no different. See, that's why they call you and they have a very shallow agenda. Maybe it's something that was missing from Zillow or realtor.com or you know, maybe they're just calling you off the sign. Uh, it doesn't happen very often these days, yet maybe that is in fact happening. And yet they call you with a very shallow agenda. It could be, what's the price? What's the lot size? Um, is it a flat backyard? Uh, is it in this school district? Whatever it is, it's a very shallow agenda. And if they don't get the answer that they're looking for, then they want to eliminate the property. Now, once they're successful at doing that, then they want to eliminate you as a salesperson, right? <laughs> Uh, so let's just talk about like incoming calls real quick and let's just take that how much is it kind of question because we got to agree that buyer prospects, they'll look at homes, open houses that they can't afford. They'll call on properties that they can't afford. And mm -hmm. so we live in this cause and effect world, right? For every action, we get a reaction. So we could, number one, give them the price. If we give them the price, well, then they're going to eliminate the property because again, most of the time they call on a property they can't necessarily afford. Second, we can tell them all about the home and how wonderful it is and we can over talk a sale, right? I think they'll want to eliminate you because there's an old saying in sales that I think, think serves us all very well and that is never say it with blah, blah, blah if you can say it with blah, right? So we don't want to over talk the sale. Uh, the third thing we could do is we could tell them all about your, how great you are, right? And trust me, I've called the competition and, and you'd be shocked at what some things that come out of their mouth. I'm number one in this market. Here's what's going on in the prospect's mind. So what's in it for me, right? Guys, it's never about us. It's always about them. Right. So the reaction there, I think, is a dial tone. And so here's the goal. We want to get a valid name, phone number, schedule, and an office appointment. How do we do that? I think... Well, first we master the first five seconds of that incoming call. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of simple um, strategies here real quick. And they're called transition strategies. So somebody calls up and says, yeah, Main Street, how much is it? You say, oh, that's a great property. Seems like everyone's calling about that one. So you're in the market to buy a home. They say, well, yes, or they say no, or we're just looking, right? Uh, whatever they say, you assume that they say yes, and you say, fantastic. So I look that property up. Tell me, what price range are you looking for? Now, Kevin... 
if we just mastered that first five seconds, we've really accomplished three powerful things with this very simple transition strategy. First, we qualified the prospect. Are they in the market to buy a home, yes or no? Yes. Second, we got the price range that they're, that they're looking in before we've divulged any information, right? And then third, and, and the final one is that we have gained control of this conversation. See, it's the person that talks during the conversation that dominates that conversation, yet the person asking questions controls that conversation. So by just right out of the bat doing what I call, you know, tape the bull, meaning you're the matador, you're in the middle of the arena, the bull is charging at you. Now, in this case, the bull represented the how much is it question, right? And if I give a short direct answer like, oh, it's on the market for 798,000, well, the bull just got me by the horns. I'm going to face down in the dirt, removed from that arena on a gurney because I'm dead. That call is over, right? Yep. So rather, a transition strategy is a pattern interrupt. It causes a break state in the thought patterns of the prospect. So it enables you to take control. Ultimately, you pull them off of their agenda, no matter how shallow that is, and it pulls them onto your agenda, right? So I'll share a couple of other simple transitions with you guys. I encourage you to do screenshots of this, by the way. Um, they call in and say, well, how much is it? Now remember, a pattern interrupt is maybe something they don't expect. What it does is it jars them just a little bit and it enables you to take control. So this is all based in neuro-linguistic programming language patterns. And they say, yeah, call on a main street, how much is it? You say, oh, you must be another one of the neighbors. And they're almost shocked, right? And so you say, they, they say, oh, no. You say, so you're in the market to buy a home. And they say, well, yes, we sure are. Fantastic. So I look that property up, tell me, what price range do you feel comfortable with? So here's another example. They say, main street, how much is it? And you say, oh, you're looking to buy just one home? <laughs> and then you buy five. Yeah, and then you just pause. They say, well, yeah. Well, fantastic, because I looked that property up. Tell me, what price range do you feel comfortable with? Mm. Really very simple, and it's just the first five seconds. Yet, guys, when you practice this, then you can master this. And when you master this, your conversion rates, well, they're going to soar. There's no question about that. So let's talk about what do you do then? Okay, so now I've got their price range. Then I'd encourage you to develop a very simple script like this. Good for you. Well, real quick, I'm logging into our multiple listing service platform. In a matter of moments, I'll be able to share with you all of the information about the property you called me about. Plus, I'll let you know how many homes are currently on the market that match your specific criteria. So tell me, how many bedrooms would you like to have in your new home? How many bathrooms? How many car garage? Ranch, two-story, tri-level? What? What lot size are you after? Any particular school district, right? And what you're doing is you're typing in this information, you click the how many button, and you got 14 listings. Now, I wanna pause here for a second because there's, there's three very powerful words in all of this dialogue, right? And those three powerful words are, so tell me. See, most realtors, they say, well, would you like for me to do that for you? No, right? No, so tell me assumes that they said yes. It assumes the sale. It enables you then to get to the next point of your dialogue, right? So replace in your sales vernacular, would you like with the words, so tell me. So much more powerful. Yes. Yeah. See, at this point, when I say there's 14 listings that match your unique criteria, right? So there's great news. You've now positioned yourself to possess something that the prospect wants. And now it's time to close, right? So the best time. However, uh, I read a book called No Bull Selling back in the mid 90s. And the author outlined a couple of stats that I thought were really important. He said that 44% of agents never ask for an appointment, meaning mm. they're just order takers and the prospect actually closes them. They looked up something on Zillow, they called up the real estate agent and said, hey, I wanna see the inside of this house, when can you show it to me? Now, even a blind, blind squirrel will find a nut from time to time, right? Yet, um, Another 22% give up after asking once, 34% give up after twice, 14% after three times, 12 after four times asking. Guys, when we total that up, that's 92% quit after they ask four times for an appointment. Now, by the way, Kevin, I'm talking about on the same phone call. Wow. On the same phone call. So essentially you close for an appointment, they shoot you down with a simple objection like, well, let me talk with my wife and I'll call you back. Let's agree that if we let them off the phone. It's over. You lost them. Done. Yeah. yeah. And 
And maybe you cop captured their phone number on your caller ID and then you're stuck on the hamster wheel of follow-up and right. they already know your phone number. So they're going to block you or they're just going to send you to voice. <laughs> or Here's my input guys. You can't lose what you don't possess. So go for it. Right. Yeah. It's a great mentality. So they say, well, let me talk to my wife and I'll call you back. Recognize what they're doing is they're playing good guy, bad guy with you. Aren't they? I'm the good guy. It's my wife. That's the bad guy. So what you say is you say, um, well, I certainly understand that. Yet, let me just ask real quick, Kevin, if, if it's okay with your wife to meet with me, is it okay with you? Mm. Now, they're the good guy, right, Kevin? Right. So they're always going to say what? Yes. Perfect. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just simply pencil in a time that you think is going to work best for your wife. I'll call you the day before to confirm. And if it works, Kevin, fantastic. If not, we'll just simply reschedule the appointment. So tell me, when do you think is going to work best for your wife? Is it weekdays or weekends? It's over. I'm in. Weekends. Perfect. So Saturday mornings or afternoons, right? So you can't lose what you don't have. Right. And then they might say something like, well, can't you just email me those listings? And you say, well, sure. In fact, I'll do it right now. Yet, Kevin, can I share with you what terrifies me about that? Let's see, if I just email you the listings, I mean, you might drive by them and frankly, you might hate them. Mm. And the problem with it is that I don't learn anything based on that interaction or experience. See, uh, about 70% of my time is spent working with buyers. I get to see over 200 homes per month, Kevin. I know the market better than anybody. And once I get that picture in my mind based on your feedback of exactly what you're looking for, I should be able to take you right to it. And you do want to find the right home quickly, don't you? Absolutely, yes. Perfect. So when can we get together? Is it weekdays or weekends? So yeah. that would be three times asking, right? And yeah. the third time, most people are going to just lay down and say, okay, let's set an appointment. Yet 92% um, quit after asking four times. And you're now, doing something there as well that I think is really interesting. I want to just point out is you're, you're really just talking about what's important to them. Like you're, you're thinking about what is in their best interest, right? And you're also, and when you mentioned, I've looked at hundreds of houses and I'm like the expert in the area, you're also talking indirectly about how good you are and the service that you're going to be able to provide for them. So for me, I'm, it's, you're embedding these thoughts in my mind without necessarily saying directly that you're a good agent, but you're kind of still saying it and I'm, I'm kind of buying in. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm buying in, you know, so it's, it's really powerful. Yeah. Remember what's going through the mind of our prospect guys. It's so what? Who cares what's in it for me? See, it's a harsh reality for most of you, yet you've got to hear it. Your prospects don't care about you. Right. They care about how they feel when they're with you. And when you talk about them and when you talk about the benefits, attaching it to them all the time, then that's when they, they become, uh, you become a magnet to buyer prospects, to seller prospects, because you're always looking out for them and their best interest. It's not about you. And when you detach from that, this, this need to look good and be right, when you let go of that and you focus on these prospects to give to them without ever remembering and receive from them without ever forgetting, guys, you'll never go wrong in this business. You become a magnet for leads, buyer and seller type leads. So um, let me just finish this thought and then I've got to jump off for another coaching call yet uh, we got two minutes. So 92% quit after asking four times. Now the author says this, he said 60% of buyers say yes after the fifth time you ask. Wow. Which means 8% of the realtors are winding up with greater than 60% of the business merely based on their ability to close. So there's a strategy in closing that we've all heard of before. It's the ABCs of selling, right? And it's nothing cheesy, no offense to Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, love the movie, right? It's Great not movie. always be closing. That is so cheesy, come on. <laughs> New ABCs or Sean Kokoska's ABCs are action, benefit, commitment. Meaning you as the, the realtor, you outline the action. What do you want them to do? Let's simply set an appointment for you to come to my office. Now, there's a question that appears in the mind of the prospect the second we ask them to do something, right? What's in it for me? Yeah. W-I-I-F-M. Why should I do that? That's why we immediately follow up with a benefit. In essence, we say here, here, Mr. And Mrs. Prospect, here's what's in it for you. And then provided it's the right value, the right benefit, then the commitment becomes really easy, right? So I'll just share this with you real quick. And I'd encourage you to maybe do a screenshot of it um, real fast as we go through this. It's, you know, fortunately, in order to get you one step closer to achieving your goal, Kevin, all we need to do now is simply set an appointment for you to come to the office. 
I'm going to download all these listings I just told you about. I'm going to get the virtual tours, the drone footage. See, Kevin, that way you get to view them on screen in my office before you invest your time to drive by them or waste your money on gas for that matter. Plus, Kevin, I'm going to share with you several negotiating strategies that are going to help you get the best deal on the home you buy and the best deal on the mortgage that you're going to obtain. So tell me, when is the best time for you to get together with me? Is it weekdays or weekends? Weekends. Yeah. So Kevin, could you follow that action first, benefit attached to the prospect second, and then commitment third? And the commitment alternative choice is kind of hard to say no to that, right? Yet most realtors say, would you like to get together? No. <laughs> Let me ask you real quick. I know we're running out of time. We have a couple of questions, but um, do you think it's necessary? Do what do you think is best to meet at the property or meet at the office? A hundred percent without question at the office. Okay. Number one, uh, safety has got to be a concern. Second, if you meet them at the house, where is their energy? Where's their attention? It's on the house. Right. And if their energy and attention is on the house, well, that means it's not on you. When you have them come to the office and when you focus on adding value to them before you even meet them, like have a special reserve parking spot for them. Have your call coordinator hand them mm -hmm. a laminated menu of, of snacks and drinks. Uh, have them fill out a clipboard like at the doctor's office to answer all your qualifying questions. Uh, you have an opportunity to give them a wow experience. In fact, I'd encourage you to go back to labcodeagents.com, click on their coaching tab, uh, skip past those other three coaches that, that we're working with, <laughs> and go to Sean Kokoska and look at last month's webinar. It's all about creating a wow experience for your customers. And guys, I shared some, some ideas and some simple uh, methodologies that will, that will create customers for life. And yeah. that's how we want to do it. So the Kevin, I, there are huge, just those two things alone. that you just mentioned. Yeah. Without a doubt. So real quick to kind of finish this off, I'd encourage you guys to develop at least three ABC scripts for all the different categories associated with working with buyers from, first time home buyers because your benefit is going to be totally different than working with an empty nester that's downsizing or for an investor for that matter. What's the benefit for an investor to work with you? Um, getting permission for your lenders to call the prospect. Okay, Mr. Prospect, I, I want to, I want to just have my lender give you a call. That's the action, right? The benefit is, you know, they're going to fill out the 1003. They're going to pull the credit report. Don't worry. It's not going to impact your credit score at all. Yet this lender has consistently beat all other lenders in our market area by several points, as well as um, lower closing costs. And you do want to save money on your, on your home purchase, right? So great, when's the best time for my lender to give you a call? Is it weekdays, weekends, or in the next 10 minutes? So uh, action, benefit, commitment. It's super easy to follow. By the way, um, many of you might be ready for coaching, yet you don't want to invest, say, $1,000 per month. We've got this uh, program called Icon Accelerator. Hmm. And it's a group program. Guys, it's a mere investment of just 97 per month or $997 for the entire year. So it's essentially one twelfth the cost of traditional coaching. Yet um, it's a group format where you can get on a, a Zoom meeting just like this with like-minded individuals. You get access to our entire learning management system. It's every script, every dialogue, every objection handler that we've got. We've got models, systems. Um, we've got... Um, all kinds of videos on this learning management platform uh, that, that will help you improve your conversion. So if you're at all interested in that, just go to, just drop me an email, grow at iconcoachingre.com. We'd love to tell you a little bit more about what we get to do here at Icon Coaching, and that is get you massive traction on your road to wealth. So Kevin, thank you for your time. I'm sorry that I've uh, got too much content for the hour. Oh, at, at the same time, uh, I look forward to next month and, uh, I may just pick up where we left off here to help you guys really get focused on converting leads. This was really, really a great call, Sean. I, I learned a lot. I know that everyone on the call learned a lot. I had a lot of questions, which uh, we uh, unfortunately are not going to be able to answer because you have to get off. But um, I, I can, I can um, share this. Uh, we've got this link here, iconcoachingre.com. Uh, I have one, one question, Sean. How long do the, um, the coaching calls last? This was one of the questions that we had. The, the group coaching, how long do they go for? Yeah, the group coaching is every week, Tuesday at two o'clock central. That's what I'm late to right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. And it is, a, it is a one hour call in a webcast format like this. I will tell you that most of the content for these calls is audience authored, meaning somebody uh, uh, puts on our private Facebook page, 
Uh, I'd really love to talk about compensation models this week on the Accelerator call. So we'll dive into the ICON proven methodology around how to compensate your people to really get them focused on keeping expenses as low as possible, profits as high as possible, and also helps you retain talent at a much higher level. So we'll dive into that topic that week. Um, or they might say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with uh, my listing appointment. Uh, let's talk about some closing strategies and techniques. And, and so I'll put together a slide deck like I did today and we'll kind of walk through that. And yet it, in every call, we open it up to a mastermind session. And I love that term mastermind. Mm, Napoleon awesome. Hill coined that term so many years ago where he said, when two or more minds come together seeking a positive solution to a situation or challenge that a third mind is actually created. And he referenced that being the mastermind. So, you know, each week, we'll dive into mastermind topics. Like last week, it was how to get listings in a no inventory market. And, you know, everybody was saying, well, here's what I'm doing and I'm getting traction or here's what I did. It didn't work. So really what this does is it enables us to really shorten the curve to our success. And uh, I wanted to make this affordable. I wanted to apply a 100% money back guarantee after the first 30 days. If you're not fully satisfied, we just credit your credit card right back. Uh, so it's, it's really a fun environment and a very supportive one at that. So check out Icon Accelerator. And those of you who really want to just dive into one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, and you're not kidding yourself, you just want to just get after it and get some extraordinary success quickly, I think one-on-one -on -one coaching is the right answer for you. And you'll see options there on our website at iconcoachingre.com. We look forward to working with you guys, earning your business and helping you achieve the results that you want. Kevin, thanks again, man. You're a great, great job on the interview. Thank the you. Thank you. So you did an amazing job. You, you made it easy. So thank you so much. Sounds like a lot of great info and I hope you all enjoy it. Take care. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.